Hey guys, welcome back to Independent Reading. Remember, we are reading Christmas in Camelot. We read the first three chapters. And when we left Jack and Annie, they had not seen the um, magic tree in months and months and months. And then all of a sudden the tree house came back. And when they went to Camelot, they met up with Morgan and King Arthur. And at that point, magic had been banned. And so Morgan has no idea how they got there with the magic tree house. So they think that maybe something is going on and they're gonna to try to figure out what's going on. So we are in chapter four and chapter four is called Who Will Go? All right, so let's see what happens in Who Will Go. I have come to see Arthur the King, the Christmas Knight said. His deep echoed from inside his helmet. His red armored gleam or armor gleamed in the firelight. King Arthur stood up. He stared fiercely at the knight, but he spoke in a calm, steady voice. I am Arthur the King, he said. Who are you? The knight did not answer Arthur's question. So you are the legendary King Arthur of Camelot, he said in a mocking voice. And these must be the famous knights of the round table. Yes said King Arthur. And again, I ask, who are you? The Christmas knight still did not answer Arthur's question. The spell dark wizard had robbed Camelot of its joy, said the Christmas knight. Has it robbed you and your men of your courage as well? You dare to question our courage? King Arthur said in a low, angry voice. So here's the Christmas knight and here's King Arthur. There's Jack and Annie and Mor well, Morgan Le Fay. Camelot is dying, the Christmas night boomed. Why has no one journeyed to the other world to recapture its joy? I have sent my best knights on such a quest, said King Arthur. They never returned. Then send more, thundered the Christmas night. No, shouted King Arthur, pounding his fist on the table. Never again will I feel good. Feed good men to the magic and monsters of the other world. Jack felt a chill of fear. What monster? Then you choose your fate, said the Christmas knight. If you will send no one else to the other world, all that your kingdom has gained through time, all beauty, music, wonder, and light, all that Camelot has ever been or could ever be will be lost and forgotten forever. No, shouted Annie. Shh. Annie, said Jack. The Christmas night turned to the knights at the table. Who will go? He boomed. We will, shouted Annie. We will, said Jack. Yes, we'll go on the quest, Annie yelled. She jumped up. No, cried Morgan Le Fay. Never, said King Arthur. Annie, said Jack. He leapt from his chair and tried to grab her. Yes thundered the Christmas night. He pointed his red gloved hand at Annie and Jack. The youngest of all, these two, they will go. They, you are mocking us, King Arthur shouted. They will go, boomed the night. His words echoed throughout the hall. Oh no, thought Jack. Yes, said Annie. She pulled Jack toward the Christmas night. King Arthur turned to his men, stop them. Several knights started to rush toward Jack and Annie. The Christmas knight raised his gloved hand high in the air. In an instant, the room felt deathly quiet. Everyone around the table was as still as a statue. King Arthur looked at, like the statue of a furious king. Queen Guinevere looked like the statue of a worried queen. The knights of the round table looked like statues of fierce knights. And Morgan Le Fay looked like the statue of a caring friend. Her mouth was open as she was called as if she were calling out to Jack and Annie, but no sound came from her lips. No sound at all. Chapter five, Rhymes of the Christmas Night. Morgan, said Annie. Annie ran to the table. She touched Morgan's cheek, then quickly pulled back her hand. She's cold. She's as cold as ice, said Annie. Tears filled her eyes. Annie turned to the Christmas night in a fury. What did you do to Morgan? She asked. Bring her back. Do not fear, the Christmas, said the Christmas night. His voice was softer and kinder. She will come back to life after you complete your quest. 
What, what exactly is our quest? Said Jack. You must journey to the other world, said the Christmas night. There you will find a cauldron. The cauldron is filled with the water of memory and imagination. You must bring a cup of the water back to Camelot. If you fail, Camelot will never come back to life. Never. How do we do all that? Asked Annie, wiping her eyes. Remember these three rhymes, said the Christmas night. Wait, let me write them down, said Jack. His hands trembled as he pulled out his notebook and pencil. He looked at the Christmas night. Okay, I'm ready, he said. Gripping his pencil, Jack made Jack feel stronger. The knight's voice rang out from inside his helmet. Beyond the iron gate, the keepers of the cauldron wait. Jack quickly wrote down the knight's words. Okay, what's next? He asked. The Christmas night went on. Four gifts you will need, the first from me. Then a cup, a compass, and finally a key. Cup, compass, key, got it, said Jack. The Christmas night's voice boomed again. If you survive to complete your quest, the secret door lies to the west. Jack copied down the last rhyme, then looked up at the knight. Anything else? He asked. Without a word, the knight pulled off his red cloak. He dropped it to the floor. It fell silently in a heap at Jack and Annie's feet. The Christmas knight snapped his horse's red reins, then galloped out of the great hall. Chapter 6. A White Comet. Once the night was gone, the candles and torches in the great hall grew dimmer. A bitter chill crept over the room. What do these three rhymes mean, said Jack, looking at his notebook. Who are the keepers of the cauldron? What's the door? I don't know, said Annie. I just know we have to save Morgan. She gathered the red cloak up in her arms. We've got our first gift. Let's go. Wait, we should figure this out first, said Jack. No. We should just go, said Annie. She turned and headed for the archway. Jack pushed his glasses into place and looked back at the round table, at the frozen king and queen, at the frozen knights, and at Morgan Le Fay. He loved Morgan. She was their great friend and teacher. If he and Annie did not go on their quest, Morgan's story and the stories of Camelot and all the stories about magic, the magic treehouse would end forever. Jack took a deep breath. He put his notebook into his backpack. Then he turned toward the archway. Annie, he said. She was gone. Annie, wait, he shouted. Wait. Jack ran out of the great hall. Annie. I'm here, she said quietly. I'm waiting. She was standing at the end of the entrance hall, peering outside. How do we get to the other world, she asked. Maybe the treehouse can take us there, said Jack. Come on. Together, Jack and Annie hurried through the inner courtyard of the castle and over the drawbridge. They ran over the frozen ground to the moonlit grove of trees. Clutching the red cloak, Annie stared up, started up the red lad, rope ladder. Jack followed. They climbed inside the treehouse and sat on the floor. Annie picked up the royal invitation. Close your eyes, I'll make the wish, she said. Jack closed his eyes. He was shivering from the cold. I wish we could go to the other world, she said Annie. The bare branches of the tree rattled, trees rattled in the wind. I think it's working, whispered Annie. The wind stopped blowing. Jack opened his eyes. He and Annie looked out the window. The dark castle loomed against the sky. They were still in Camelot. It did, didn't work, said Jack, his teeth chattering. Yes, it did, whispered Annie. Look down. Standing below the treehouse was the biggest deer Jack had ever seen. The deer was staring up at them with amber eyes. His huge antlers seemed to glow in the cold moonlight. Most amazing of all, the deer was completely white, as white as new fallen snow. A white stag, said Jack. Puffs of frosty air blew from the stag's nostrils. He stepped toward the treehouse and shook his giant head. Ooh, excuse me. He's come to take us on our journey, said Annie. People don't ride deer, said Jack, but Annie had already started down the rope ladder. Watch from the window as she walked to the stag and softly spoke. The stag knelt and Annie climbed on his back. Come on, she called to Jack. Bring the cloak. Okay, okay, said Jack. 
He gathered up the heavy cloak, clutching it against his chest. He climbed down the rope ladder. He hurried over to Annie and the white stag. Put on the cloak and climb on behind me, said Annie. Jack put the cloak on over his backpack. He pulled his shoulders and buttoned it at the neck. As the cloak fell down around his body, the soft, smooth cloak or cloth made him feel warm and safe. Ready? Said yeah, said Jack. He climbed on the stag's back behind Annie. The white stag slowly stood up. Annie leaned forward, putting her arms around its neck. Jack leaned forward, too, and held on to Annie. There's the white stag. Red velvet cloak draped over both of them, falling past their feet. The white stag stepped gracefully over the frozen grass. He walked through the outer gate of the castle. He blew out a puff of air, then broke into a leaping run. Jack held on tightly to Annie as the stag dashed across the frost-covered field. He jumped over hedgerows and stone walls. He bounded across icy streams. Annie's braids floated in the wind, the red cloak billowing behind them. Jack was amazed at how easy it was to ride on the stag's back. He felt calm and safe as the stag sped like a white comet through the wintry countryside. The stag ran past flocks of sheep and herds of goats asleep in the meadows. He ran past thatched, thatched huts and quiet stables. The stag ran on and on starry night. Jack saw a cloud-covered mountain range in the distance. When they came close to the craggy mountains, Jack was sure the stag would stop but he galloped on, not even breaking his stride as he started up a rocky slope. The stag finally came to a halt on the steep cliff. In a windy swirl of fog and cloud, he knelt to the ground and Jack and Annie slid off his back. The stag stood up. He stared down at them with his glowing amber eyes. Thank you, said Annie. Do you have to leave now? The stag lowered his head and raised it again. He blew out a puff of air, then leapt away vanishing into the mist. Bye, Annie said wistfully. She stared into the mist for a moment, then turned to Jack. What do we do now? I don't know, said Jack. Let's read the three rhymes again. He reached under the red cloak and pulled the pack. He took out his notebook and started to read the first rhyme, Beyond the Iron Gate. Jack, interrupted Annie, look. Jack looked up. The wind had blown away some of the fog. Beyond the cliff rose another mountain. A huge gate was built into its side. A pale light shone between the gate iron bars. Two knights in gold armor stood guard under flaming torches. Oh man, whispered Jack. That's it, the iron gate, said Annie. If we pass through the gate, we'll be in the other world. Da, 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 chapter seven, a good trick. As the wind blew away more fog, Jack and Annie saw a bridge. It was made of thick wooden planks held together with iron bands. It stretched all the way from the edge of the cliff where they were standing to the iron gate. Come on, let's go, said Annie. Wait, said Jack, what about the guards? The two guards in gold armor stood perfectly still. Their huge spears gleamed in the torchlight. I don't know, said Annie. Read the second rhyme. Jack looked in his notebook and read aloud. For gifts you will need, the first one from me, then a cup, a compass, and finally a key. The first gift is the Christmas night's cloak, said Annie. Yeah, I guess it's supposed to help us somehow, said Jack. He unbuttoned the cloak from around his neck. Then he held it out to get a good look at it. Ooh, excuse me, guys. Maybe it can make us invisible, said Annie. That's nuts, said Jack. Seriously, she said. Sometimes cloaks do stories. Here's the gate. Here's our two guard friends here. Here's Jack and Annie. They gotta cross the bridge. And here's the gate to enter into the other world. Well, it didn't make me invisible, did it? Said Jack. Maybe you were wearing it wrong, said Annie. Give it to me. Oh, brother, said Jack. But he handed the cloak to Annie. It flapped in the wind as she pulled it around her. Can you see me? She said. Annie, said Jack, rolling his eyes. I can see you. Jack looked back at the gate. Even if we get past the what then? 
he wondered. The other world swallowed up Camelot's best knights. King Arthur said it was filled with magic and monsters. Jack, look at me now. Jack turned to Annie. She wasn't there. Where are you? He said, staring at the darkness. Cool, it works. Where are you? Jack said again, turning around. Here. Jack felt a hand touch his face. Ah! He said, jumping back. It's me. I'm invisible. I pulled the hood over my head. That's the trick. Jack felt a chill run down his spine. Oh, man, he whispered. Watch, I'm going to take off the hood. In a flash, Annie was back. It feels creepy to be invisible, she said. Jack was speechless. The, only, or the magic only happens when you wear the hood, said Annie. Good, huh? Oh, yeah, said Jack. He shook his head. This is just too weird. Don't worry about it being weird. It's a great way to get past the guards, said Annie. Plus, it's a way to hide in the other world. We don't know what we'll find in there, right? Yeah, right, said Jack. Okay, good, said Annie. Now stand beside me and don't move. Jack put away his notebook. Annie threw the velvet cloak over his, sh his shoulders and backpack. Great, it's big enough for both of us, she said. She carefully arranged the folds around them. Then she pulled the huge hood over both their heads. Jack looked down. He couldn't see his at all. He felt like he couldn't breathe. In a panic, he threw off the hood. I hate that, he said. I told you, it's creepy, said Annie. But if we don't wear it, we won't get past the guards. Yeah, I know, and we won't have protection in the other world, said Jack. He took a deep breath. <sighs> okay, let's do it. Annie pulled up the hood again. I'll hold on to the hood so it won't blow off. She said, you just think about getting across the bridge, nothing else. But I can't see my feet, said Jack. You don't need to see your feet to walk, said Annie. Come on, do it for Morgan. Right, Jack. He and Annie stepped onto the bridge. Whatever you do, don't look down, she said Annie. As they started over the bridge, the wind whistled around them. Jack couldn't help it. He looked down. Not only was his body missing, but the fog beneath the bridge was moving in a wild, spinning swirl. Jack felt dizzy and faint. He stopped. Keep going, Annie whispered. Jack took a deep breath and looked straight ahead. Then he started walking again. He went slowly, step by step, toward the pale light beyond the bars of the gate. In the flickering torchlight, the guards took, looked like giants. As Jack and Annie slipped invisibly by them, Jack held his breath. How will we open the gate, he wondered. Whoosh, said Annie loudly. Jack's heart nearly stopped. Had Annie lost her mind? What are you doing, he whispered. I'm in the wind, Annie whispered back. Whoosh! Annie gave the gate a shove. It swung open as if pushed by the wind. Jack looked back and saw that the guards had turned in their direction. Quick, Annie whispered. Jack and Annie moved silently through the gateway. Whoosh! said Annie. She pushed the gate back. It shut with a clang. Through the bars, Jack saw the guards face the bridge again. Good work, he said to Annie. Thanks, she said. Jack and Annie then turned away from the gate. Oh, whispered Annie. The other world, whispered Jack. And that, my friends, is where we stop today. Now, tomorrow we will start with chapter eight called The Other World. So I hope you like it so far. We are still trying to figure out what's going to happen next. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow.